Hi, this is Steve Smith, and this is going to be part two of the dependency inversion principle, one of the principles of object-oriented design and a software fundamental part of the solid principles of object-oriented programming. In this module, we're going to talk about project dependencies in our Microsoft Visual Studio applications. We'll look at the problem that occurs when we have dependencies flowing in such a way that the infrastructure and low-level concerns of our application are depended upon by all the other projects in our app. We'll go through an example that shows this particular type of architecture, which is very common, and the problems that arise when one uses it, and then we'll refactor this design applying the dependency inversion principle at the solution level so that we can improve the design and maintainability of our application. Finally, we'll wrap up with some related fundamentals. In a typical layered or tiered application design, there are separate logical and sometimes physical layers. For instance, it's very common to have a user interface layer, a business logic layer, and a data access layer. Oftentimes, these will each correspond to separate projects in Visual Studio. The nice thing about this approach to design is that it supports encapsulation and abstraction. It also works at the application level that is appropriate to each layer. Each level should only know about one level deep, if possible, because this allows for the individual layers to be swapped out at a later date without affecting the layers above it. This provides a good unit of reuse, but the lowest levels are generally the most reusable because there are many more layers above them than, for instance, a user interface layer, which is typically not reusable and usually is at the top of the dependency hierarchy. This diagram shows an example of the traditional or naive layered architecture approach with the flow of dependencies going from top to bottom. As you can see, the user interface is sitting at the top here, and it's depending on a business logic layer that makes up the, the main central area of the app. And most of the business logic layer classes are going to end up calling data access layer or common uh, assembly classes. And the data access layer or some kind of uh, service layer is going to talk to the database or talk to services. If the dependency flows in this direction, and since we know dependency is transitive, this means that the user interface is always dependent on the business layer, and the business layer is always dependent on this data access layer, which in turn depends on the existence of a database and services in order for it to function. What this means is that your application is very difficult to test or change or work with in isolation from a database or these services because of this hard dependency that's flowing from the business layer through the data access layer. This means also that we are not depending on an abstraction, rather we are depending on an explicit instance of the data access layer which we're going to be working with. We can invert this architecture so that the thing that sits at the bottom of our dependency structure is instead the object model, the core, the domain objects, as well as perhaps our business logic and services. These can be packaged together as a single assembly or separately if you prefer. It's also important to note that any of the dependencies that these have are represented by interfaces at this layer. Next, the other areas of the application, such as data access, user interface, tests, IO operations, and web services, or WCF, would all be on top of this and would depend on these services and objects. Infrastructure concerns outside of our application, such as the database or web services themselves, would reside off to the side where only the data access module would depend on it or the WCF or web service module. But note that our business logic and core domain objects would not have this dependency and as a result, they could be tested without having to have these in play. Let's look at a demo of how we can build an application that follows the traditional hierarchy and what effect this has on our ability to work with that application. One of the new features of Visual Studio 2010 is the ability to use the Architecture tab to generate a dependency graph by assembly. If we do this for this project, we'll see something like what's shown here, where we have our ntier.web and web service assemblies at the top of our dependency hierarchy. And these are correspondingly referencing our business logic layer. And the business logic layer is currently uh, referencing the data access layer. 
The data access layer, as well as pretty much every other assembly, is making use of a set of common functions that's in a common assembly. And then these are all referencing externals, such as ADO.NET or web service classes. This is also where you would find things like the database or external things like the file system, etc. Looking at this design, it's very clear that our business layer depends on the data access layer, which in turn depends on externals. This can make it very difficult to change the business layer or to test it in an isolated fashion. For instance, if we were to go and create a test class like this one, we could say that we wanted to have a class that tests the security class of the business layer and say that security's login method should return a user ID for a valid user. We construct our test with a valid user ID, email, and password. And of course, we would like to be able to inject these into the system somehow so that we could do this test uh, with our data here that we are passing in. Unfortunately, this is implemented as a static method, making it very difficult for us to do any sort of dependency injection. And when we write this test, if we stop ignoring it and run our test, we'll see that because of this dependency on the data layer, our test throws an exception. And that exception is that it can't find the connection string in the web config. Of course, I don't want there to be a connection string in my unit tests web config because I don't want unit tests to be talking to external resources. I only want to be testing the business layer. I don't want to be testing the data access layer or the database with this particular test suite. Now, I actually put together this demo many years ago when .NET 1.0 was out in order to show how interior applications should be structured. This was before I was familiar with the dependency inversion principle. And one of the things that I struggled with as I put together this demo was how I could easily swap out one data access layer for another. Part of the intent of this demo was to be able to show how easy it would be to take, for instance, our security layer and change it so that the data access layer that it's using could be swapped from one that uses SQL Server through the SQL parameters and SQL connections for a different data access layer, which is here called data access layer two. And data access layer two uses an XML file. So the idea was that you one could switch from one to the other. And in the course of my demo, the way that I would do that, because I didn't know any better, was that I would go in here and I would have to change DAL to DAL2, and I would have to change my references to make sure I had the reference to data access layer two. And everywhere that I called data access layer one, I would have to change those references. Of course, if I can just delete the reference and lean on the compiler a bit, it'll show me all those places and I can come in here and change them appropriately. And this, in this particular demo, I only have three methods that call data access layer, so I only have three places where I need to make this change. But the fact that I have to go and touch every line of code is definitely a violation of the open-closed principle. And it was certainly something that bothered me at the time, but I just didn't know of a proper way to change that and avoid that situation. Many applications that I still see have the same problem because they rely on static methods and or because they use the same type of dependency hierarchy that puts the data access layer below the business layer with a direct class level reference and assembly level reference that passes from the business logic to the data access logic. This results in more fragile applications that are more difficult to change as you evolve them and as you wish to uh, adjust their behavior. Let's analyze some of the problems with the existing application structure. The biggest one is that dependencies tend to flow toward infrastructure concerns such as the database and XML files going through data access layers that are tightly coupled to these structures. The core business layer and domain classes, such as we have them in this example, all depend on these implementation details. And if these implementation details change, it requires us to go in and change our business layer, at the very least recompiling it, but in this case actually going and touching lots of uh, individual method calls in order to fix their references so that they continue to function. The result of this is that we have tight coupling between the business layer and by extension the data access layer and the XML file and the infrastructure components that we are using in our application. There's no way to change these implementation details without a recompile resulting in an open closed principle violation and making this very difficult to test in any kind of an isolated fashion. 
Dependency injection shows that dependency is transitive. If the UI depends on the business logic layer, which in turn depends on the data access layer, which in turn depends on the database, then everything depends on the database. We want to instead depend on abstractions where we know that there are likely to be changes in our application. We want to package up these abstractions, these interfaces, with the client that's using them, in this case the business logic layer, in keeping with the interface segregation principle. Finally, we want to structure our solutions and projects so that the core or business logic layer is at the center or at the bottom of our dependency hierarchy with the fewest dependencies and with no dependencies on external infrastructure. Now let's see a demo of how we can refactor our naive N-tier design into something that follows the dependency inversion principle and gains some of the benefits of a more flexible architecture. We're going to refactor this N-tier application in order to make it work in such a way that the business layer is the center of all the dependencies rather than depending upon the data access layer. I've changed this application back to where it was when we started so that it's now using the N-tier data access layer assembly, which is depending on the SQL database. If we run our test here, we can see that it fails, and it fails with the exception saying that it cannot find our connection string. The reason for that is because this security.login method is defined over here, and it's calling data access layer security login through a static method call. And if we look at the data access layer security login, we can see that it's actually generating some SQL, opening up a connection, and ultimately executing that using ADO.net. When we're done, we'll be able to use this test with a little bit of additional code in order to pass in the expected record that we want to find, run our login, and verify that it did in fact return the correct result. We'll then be able to add additional tests if we would like to make it so that our login and security classes function the way we expect them to. Let's get started. The first thing we need to do is go into the security.login method and make it so that it's no longer static. Static methods are very difficult to test and very difficult to mock out in your tests, so eliminating that is the first step in improving our design. Once we do this, we need to build and fix anything that was expecting a static method and change it by simply newing up the class that we need and applying a couple of parentheses. If we do this in each location where it is being used, we quickly get back to a state where everything builds. There. Now we have a security class instance that we can use. The next step is we want to generate an interface that shows the things that this depends upon. I'm going to use what's called the repository pattern in the definition of my interface to make this work. Now, if we look at what the security code is actually doing, it's selecting a user uh, based on their email and password and returning back that user record. So let's look at how we would identify an interface for this. In the security class, at the business logic layer level, we would say that this is depending on some kind of a data access repository that's able to get a user by email and password. So I'm going to say that we need a new interface. We'll call this public interface user repository. And we'll say that it has a method called get by email password that takes in a string email and a string password. And it returns back an int, which is the user ID. Now I can also come in here and say that I need a new constructor for security. And in this constructor, I am expecting, we'll make this an I user repository. I'm expecting an I user repository called user repository. And I'm going to introduce and initialize a field called underscore user repository. And now I can take that instance, 
and use its method here. So I really want to say underscore user repository dot get by email password. And at this point, I'm back to a state where I can rebuild. Except that I don't have a default constructor. So the next thing I need to do is create a default constructor. And I'm going to have it use the uh, other constructors interface and pass in a default implementation, which in this case we're going to say is a SQL user repository. Now, I don't actually have one of these yet, so we're gonna generate one. And this all looks good. And we're gonna implement the members. And now we should be able to build. All right, maybe not. What did we miss? Oh yes, we need some curly braces. And now we can build. All right, so at this point we have an interface. We have a couple of constructors now. And we've created a SQL user repository that doesn't actually do anything yet, but it will. And the SQL user repository right now is living inside of the same file, but we're gonna break that up in a moment. So the next step is to move around some files. We need this interface to live in its own file, so we're gonna say move it to another file. And we further want the actual SQL user repository to live in its own file. And in fact, we're going to see that we want it to live in an entirely different location, different assembly. But for now, we're gonna create a new folder for our interfaces. And we'll move our iUser repository into this folder. And then I also want to create another location to put this SQL user repository. So I'm just going to create a new data access project. So we're going to have a new project here. Uh, we'll call it a uh, C Sharp class library of interior.data.sql. Interior data SQL does not need to have any classes in it at the moment but we do want it to have our SQL user repository, which we can now delete from here. And this SQL user repository is going to have to have a reference back to that interface. So we'll add a project reference to into your BLL, and we'll ensure that uh, this repository here has the right namespace. And that looks good. Now the challenge here is that we no longer are able to have our default constructor here know about that SQL user repository. So we're gonna just comment that out for now. But we'll take that code and we'll have to put it where things are calling this. So in these three places where we call our constructor, really only two of them, we're gonna to need to insert that code. So we're gonna insert it here. And in addition to this, we're gonna to have to give them a reference now to this new location. So n tier web is gonna to have to know about this new project reference with uh, n tier data SQL. And n tier web service is gonna also have to have a new reference to that same one. And that's just so that we can build. Now, if we look back to our error list, I have one more I need to fix, I believe. Well, let's see, I'm pretty sure there were two. All right, so here, I need to add that, and it's happy. And here, I need that namespace, so it's happy. Now, in my test, I don't wanna add any dependency on the SQL because that's not what I want. So I want to have instead something like a new fake user repository. And for this, we're going to go ahead and new this up. And a fake user repository, we'll need to implement that method as well. And we can tell a fake user repository to do something like return 
valid user ID, where valid user ID is a public int field on that class. We can further say that we have a public string valid email, public string valid password, and then we can simply say if email equals valid email and password equals valid password, return valid user ID. Else return zero. And now we can come up here and we can change this so that we say var fake repository equals new fake repository. Fake repository dot valid user ID equals valid user ID. Fake repository valid email equals valid email. And fake repository dot valid password equals valid password. Now the last thing we need to do is use our fake repository instead of this new fake user repository. And at this point, we should be able to run our test and we should have a passing test. If we look back at our business logic layer and specifically at the method that we changed, you can see that we have, in this case, a single interface that we needed to create and we eliminated the new keyword from anywhere inside this class. We delegated the responsibility for determining which particular instance of a user repository we would be using to the caller, which is inverting that dependency, that's applying the dependency inversion principle. So this is poor man's IOC we weren't able to use in this case because we moved the implementation into its own assembly that we don't want to be referencing and push that uh, responsibility for newing up that SQL user repository to our calling code. What this allowed us to do is to have our user interface layer, which is this login.aspx, is able to say that it wants to use a SQL database here. And in fact, we could use an IOC container to make this much more flexible. But for our purposes here, you can see that we can just hard code it into the user interface. And this still allows our test to pass in a different implementation of the iUser repository. In this case, we've created a fake user repository that lets us set the valid user and password information and then test for it. Now there's nothing to say that I had to do this in this particular way with three public fields. Instead, I could have had an array list of users that I wanted to specify and that would have worked just as well. One last note is uh, in addition to these sort of services like security here that doesn't have any kind of state but is simply a collection of methods that apply, there are also going to be domain objects. In this case, the only domain object that we really have in our application is this user details class that we haven't really done anything with thus far. And right now this lives in the common assembly because it's used by multiple layers in this application. It would be perfectly acceptable to take this and move this class into our core as a domain object, call it user most likely, and any kind of logic that was specific to the user would also live in this class. And then it would be depended upon by any of the other areas in our application. So for instance, if we implemented our users services, which have things like add user and get user, these would turn into a repository. The repository would know about how to create users or fetch users. And when returning a user, it would return back that core domain user class that would be inside of that business layer assembly rather than in a separate assembly. After we complete our refactoring of the end tier business layer to make it use uh, separate interfaces for its dependencies, you can see that the dependency graph now looks something like this with the user interface web and web service layers depending on the infrastructure SQL layer directly and the business logic layer. But notice that the business logic layer no longer depends on its infrastructure.
The unit tests are able to depend on it and test it in isolation. This dependency from the UI to the data layer would also easily be broken if we introduced another assembly that was specifically for dependency resolution. And it's a common practice to create such an assembly where one's IOC container work resides. So to summarize, the most important thing that I want you to take away from this module is that you should not depend on infrastructure assemblies from your core business layer in your Visual Studio solution. You can apply the dependency inversion principle to reverse these dependencies by taking new interfaces, adding them to your business layer, and then having the implementations of those interfaces be in separate projects that depend on the core business layer. Some of the fundamentals that are related to what we've talked about include the open-closed principle, the interface segregation principle, and the strategy design pattern. And for additional reading, I suggest the Agile Principles, Patterns, and Practices book by Robert C. Martin and Micah Martin, as well as this Martin Fowler article on injection in general. This has been Principles of Object-Oriented Design, the Dependency Inversion Principle, Part 2, for Pluralsight On Demand. Thanks for watching, and I hope that you'll find additional videos useful on the Pluralsight On Demand library.